My uncle Ahmed unexpectedly and suddenly passed away a few years ago in Iraq. He had had a silent heart attack while at his granddaughter's wedding. He just fell asleep in his chair and didn't wake up. It was quite peaceful when you think about it. As sad as it was, it led me to think about the individual risk factors that contributed to his death. The usual suspects, was he a smoker? Did he excessively drink alcohol? Was he physically inactive or overweight? Did he have any medical conditions that we were aware of? None of the above. He died in the context of a protracted civil war in the absence of any major individual risk factor, and that's what I'd like to speak to you about this evening. I'm a public health doctor, and I like to research government policies that affect the health of populations. For my PhD, I'm studying a particular government policy, cold-blooded war. How does war affect health, my thesis asks. Now, you must think I am studying at the University of the Bleeding Obvious. Of course, war affects health badly, very badly and in multiple ways. But just how badly is badly? Can you quantify it? I'm a British Iraqi, and war is a topic close to my heart. I've been to Iraq many times, and most of my family still live there. An important point in my life was the 15th of February, 2003. I remember climbing the base of Nelson's Column, Trafalgar Square, London, and seeing a sea of protesters holding placards, shouting slogans. They were protesting against the impending invasion of Iraq. It was the biggest political demonstration in this country's history. Once the war in Iraq started, an organization was formed. It was called the Iraq Body Count, considered one of the most reliable sources of information with respect to civilian deaths resulting from the war. They took information from press releases, from NGO reports, and other sources. They validated it and estimated between 180,000 to 200,000 civilian deaths occurred in Iraq since the war started. Just pause for a second there. 180 to 200,000 people. That's equivalent to a small city in the UK like Southampton. Unfortunately, my cousin was one of those who passed away in the violence of Iraq. His name was Osama Amin Mustafa. He got on the bus one morning on the way to work, and he was killed by a roadside bomb. He was only 30 years old. He left behind a young family. It was really tragic. But in every conflict I have studied, the number of nonviolent deaths vastly outweighs the number of violent ones, even in the most brutal of wars. Take Iraq, for example. Half the doctors have left, countless hospitals are closed, and those that remain open are understaffed, have lack of medication, and are very helpless in preventing death in even the most basic of medical conditions, such as childbirth complications, such as diabetes complications, such as vaccine-preventable diseases. Now, why stop at death? Even if you're not directly or indirectly killed by war, the chances are if you're living in a war situation, you're going to be directly affected by war. Disability, amputation, torture, rape, kidnap, violence, loss of employment, loss of school, schooling, forced displacement. The list goes on, and it creates physical and mental scars for generations to come. I remember, as a child, I climbed this 52-meter minaret in a, a, a city called Samara, just north of Iraq, beautiful mosque. And I was playing with my cousins and eating ice cream overlooking the Tigris Valley. Lovely memories. But cultural destruction plays such an important role during wars. Now, those children have been replaced by men in uniform, the ice creams replaced by snipers. It's a hotspot for terrorist activity, and half of the minaret is destroyed. Cultural destruction affects the mental health of the population around it and destroys the fabric of society. A few years ago, I was very lucky to visit Lebanon on the Daniel Turnberg Fellowship, which was founded by the Academy. Um, Lebanon has had a protracted war, which ended in the mid-90s. And I remember walking along the Green Line. This is a line that splits Beirut into two, east and west, Muslim and Christian, the warring parties at the time. It's called the Green Line because nobody lived there. It was too dangerous, and all the plants and trees just grew out of control. My colleague in the American University of Beirut, uh, Professor Abla Sibai, analyzed this at the time and found that simply crossing the Green Line on your way to work was independently associated with the risk of heart disease, even controlling for all the known factors. Why? Because wars aren't just bloody, but they're bloody stressful 
and the link between mental health and physical health is well established. Chronic stress causes a hormonal imbalance, reduces your immunological tolerance, and puts you at risk for all sorts of diseases, including cancers, possibly even silent heart attacks in the case of my uncle. We have to change the way we think about war and health. War is not about counting the number of civilian deaths from violent causes. There are health effects that extend far beyond that. My research is among the first to take routinely available, publicly available, varied data sources across time and across populations and use new modeling and statistical techniques to assess the impacts of war, not just on death, but on a range of diseases. Some of the questions I ask is, is, uh, include, does the type of war or the, the weapons used or the tactic used affect the health of the population exposed to it? It may not seem obvious, but during the 90s in the Bosnia and Serbian wars of independence, Tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition were used that um, had depleted uranium in the casings, and these were littered across the soil and water, and the increased risk of cancer was well studied there. In the ongoing war in Syria, the tactic of siege is very commonly used in cities, towns, and areas, and yes, they're not being exposed to, to explosions or violence or threats, but just being calorie restricted has far-reaching health consequences. Siege affects those most in need of nutrients, adolescents, children, unborn fetuses. They're the ones who, affect, who are affected the most. And we know from studies of the siege of Leningrad and the Dutch famine that the long-term consequences of siege are devastating. So how does war affect health? Very badly, but we can quantify it now with our modeling techniques. I'll leave you with three reasons why this is important. Health system planning, the humanitarian response, and advocacy. If we can monitor trends in population health over time, including in countries that are fragile and move into conflict, then out into the post-conflict period, we can do something about it when it goes wrong, when the health goes wrong. If war is causing excess cancer cases or excess diabetes cases, then we can help prioritize and resource allocate accordingly. Yes, not all countries will have the ability to allocate its resources to cover every um, health effect from the war, but we can help prioritize. With respect to the humanitarian response, when I visited Lebanon on the Daniel Turnberg Fellowship, I was involved in assessing how the Syrian war was being responded to in Lebanon from a humanitarian perspective. As excellent a job they do, the humanitarian system is, unfo is unfortunately structured and financed in a way that makes it accountable to their funders more than the people in need. And funders were reluctant to give money to insulin and for mental health, you know, these boring diseases. They wanted the sexy stuff like malnutrition in children, like tuberculosis and HIV, things that the Syrian refugees were not experiencing. So knowing how war affects health can help guide this in future conflicts. And finally, advocacy. Unfortunately, we're in a world where the loudest voice is the one that's heard. And with all this health information now available, we really can use it better than ever to lobby our politicians, to convince our journalists, our communities, even ourselves, that going to war has far-reaching health consequences beyond violent civilian deaths. Even during a war, health can be used as a tool to promote ceasefires, as was done in Syria, where polio vaccinations were called for um, and ceasefires uh, ensued. Unfortunately, everyone loses in war, and I know my research is just showing more ways we can lose, but I hope it can be minimized with this information going into the future. Thanks for listening. <laughs>